I'm just waiting for that one sign. The YouTube thing. Okay. Okay, so we are live now. So it's a pleasure to welcome all of you for this August edition of the IISC TIFR webinar series in chemical sciences. And it's just rightly placed almost, uh, you know, four days away from our Independence Day. And, um, and we have a speaker from, um, uh, from Imperial College London, who is going to uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, talk about, give insights about photovoltaic, um, you know, e energy conversion. So I think it's appropriate um, uh, that uh, uh, we are celebrating this month, of course, for a variety of reasons for the national uh, pride, but it's appropriate that um, we, uh, we are actually sort of um, have a very good scientific relationship with uh, the British community. And uh, today is one of the part of the celebration of that. So um, uh, with that, I would like to also welcome all of you to um, uh, the, one of the many editions of this series. Um, the, the webinar series was actually conceptualized by Professor Satish Patil and me. Professor Satish Patil, who is from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. We have been close collaborators and it, it was thought during the times of pandemic in 2020 um, uh, when travel was almost barred, in fact, this year also, pretty much, um, we thought that students um, would uh, be very greatly benefited if we could organize something which allows experts from various communities in chemical sciences to talk about the fundamentals of a subject topic and not only explain that in great tutorial style talks, but also enumerate the grand challenges of the contemporary research in that area. And um, uh, we have been very successful in getting, um, uh, you know, a variety of experts from around the world talking about, um, you know, molecular propensities of aggregation, uh, spectroscopic tools of, uh, you know, contemporary tools for detection, and also things which are as as application centric, like making of a battery. Um, today, of course, keeping the energy theme, uh, we have Professor Jenny Nelson from uh, the Department of Physics, Imperial College London, who is going to talk about solar photovoltaic energy conversion processes with molecules. Um, without further ado, I would uh, like Professor Satish Patel to actually formally introduce uh, Jenny and um, you know, uh, talk about the wonderful work she has been doing for over the past few years. Satish? Okay, thank you very much. So let me welcome you again one, one more time for this IISC TIFR webinar. So it's a, indeed my uh, pleasure and a great honor to introduce today's uh, speaker, Professor Jenny Nelson. So she did BA honors uh, in Churchill College in 1980 to 83. Uh, in physics and theoretical physics. It's affiliated to Cambridge University. And she obtained her PhD uh, in physics from Department of Physics in University of uh, Bristol. She held numerous academic positions. Uh, in 1989 to 1997, she was a postdoctoral research associate at Imperial College London. Since then, she has been there in uh, Imperial College London as a lecturer, a reader, and currently a professor of physics. So since January, 2021, she also hold a Royal Society Research Professorship, uh, still at Imperial College London. Uh, of course, she has done some remarkable work in the area of photovoltaic, and she has received numerous awards. Okay, so I'm not going to read all of them. That is itself is going to be a seminar. So I would read very few important ones. So she uh, uh, received, uh, a honorary fellow from Churchill College, Cambridge, Institute of Physics Faraday Medal. Uh, this is one of the premier award in UK. Uh, 2015, she got Helmut's uh, International Fellow Award. She's an elected fellow of the Institute of Physics and also uh, elected fellow of the Royal Society. Of course, her research 
uh, output has resulted over uh, 40,000 uh, citation uh, with a H index of uh, 104. And she, uh, she has given several, several uh, invited and keynote lectures at international conference in the last uh, four years. Remarkably, she has written 11 book chapter and a book uh, which is called something called Physics of Solar Cells. I'm the great beneficiary of that book, right? It is on my desk. It's not only benefited me academically, but I've been referring this book extensively while teaching a course at Indian Institute of Science. So with this, I would like to invite Professor Nelson to begin her talk on it. Uh, this is the first tutorial talk. Jenny, please. So uh, th thank you very much. Um, a good evening to, to, to my audience. And thank you, Satish, for the introduction. And uh, both of you with Yotishman for, for organizing the, the series. So um, the, the, the first thing I, I have to say, although this is a seminar in, in chemical sciences, I'm going to start with some concepts from physics, <laughs> um, which will be necessary when we, when we think about um, how to understand the, the relevant chemistry if we're doing solar energy conversion with, with molecules. So this is basically the, I'm, I'm giving two lectures, one today, one tomorrow. And today I'm going to go through the, the, the basic ideas and uh, sort of concepts that we need to, to try to understand um, how to make the most of photovoltaic solar energy conversion in molecular materials. So I'm going to start without considering molecular materials at all, just consider um, solar energy conversion um, in semiconductors. And then we'll go on to consider in the second part what's different in um, organic semiconductors. And then in the third part, I'll try to present how we can think about the photovoltaic process in molecular materials as a series of molecular transitions. Um, so using concepts that are more familiar from physical chemistry. So to begin, um, we have uh, we, 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 we have uh, the sun providing us with a huge amount of energy. A, a so-called standard sun gives us about 1,000 watts of radiant energy per square meter. Um, and um, that can be converted in, in different ways. Um, we're familiar, of course, with the conversion of solar energy into heat, um, into chemical potential energy, for example, through photosynthesis, and then what we'll talk about today is into electrical, into electrical work. And for all of those processes, at the heart of it, there is a process that involves a transition where a photon of light is absorbed in a material. Of course, there are different types of materials. It stimulates an electron to move to a higher energy level. And then as that electron decays back to where it or tries to decay back to where it comes from, it gives up some of the uh, extra energy that it's gained, either as heat through collisions with other atoms in the solid, or um, as chemical potential energy, which may be converted into electric work if that happens in an electrical environment. So there's some kind of common ground between the processes of energy conversion in, 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 in all three cases. And in the case of photovoltaic energy conversion, we start off with um, energy from photons in the sun. We want to end up with the maximum uh, fraction of that, of that radiant energy in the form of electrical work, that is the product of a flux of electric charges, along with an electrochemical potential energy that they carry. But we can't avoid that some of the energy is given up as heat, as charge carriers relax, and we can't uh, either succeed in harvesting all of the photons from the sun. So we have to make some compromise, and the limiting efficiency is around about 30% um, for, for the sun that we've got. So the, to, to sort of achieve photovoltaic energy conversion, we basically require in any material system three things. And one is we need an energy gap um, across which electrons can be excited. And the, the, the role of the energy gap is to prevent. So when an electron is excited in a solid, if it has a free pathway through many small steps to decay back to where it came from, it's going to do that very quickly. And it's going to do that faster 
um, than, than you could capture the electron and take it out. So we need to introduce a, a gap to stop that from happening. And the other role of the gap is to define the electrochemical potential energy or ultimately the voltage that we can extract from these excited charge carriers. That's the first thing we need is a gap. The second thing um, is we need once um, a, an electron has been excited, we need to be able to separate that electron from the point at which it was um, generated because that point will then bear a positive charge. And you then tend to have um, a Coulombic interaction between the positive uh, charge left behind and the electron that was promoted. And we need to overcome that for the charge carrier to be free. And the third thing we need is a direction. Um, so if we have, if we, we can absorb light in a material that will promote um, for, for um, that, that will promote electrons to a higher energy state, but if they diffuse, in any direction, in the end, you'll have no current. And if you have no current, you have no electrical work. So we want to have a preferential direction in which the electrons should diffuse. And that's sort of the trick of a photovoltaic device is introducing that asymmetry into a material so that there's a preferred direction. And we're going to look at how that happens. So how to, first of all, the thing we need is, is, a, is an electrical, is a gap in the energy. In, in the energy spectrum that, that electrons can occupy. And that is provided um, naturally by a semiconductor. So in an inorganic semiconductor like silicon, like gallium arsenide, we typically think about these in their crystalline form where you have um, atoms arranged. And um, if it's a crystal, that will give rise to a band structure where you have a precise relationship between the momentum of electrons that can occupy states in that material and the direction. Um, but if we sort of what, what in the end this band structure gives us would be a series of energies where you may have charges and where you may not have charges. And in the semiconductor, the important thing is that there should be a gap between um, those levels that are normally filled we call those the valence band and those levels that are normally empty, we call them the conduction band. And the semiconductor is kind of the basic uh, uh, workhorse of almost every solid state electronic device, um, including the solar cell, um, photodiodes, LEDs, transistors, and everything else. And all the time when we work with a, photovolt with a semiconductor device, we are working with um, minority populations. What do the what does an electron do when it reaches a conduction band and what happens to the positive poles that are left behind? So this is kind of, the, these are concepts. You have the structure of the material that will give rise to some band structure. And importantly, in, 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 in energy space, we have a density of states. We have energies that are occupied, that can be occupied by electronic charge carriers and energies that cannot. And those that cannot provide a band gap. This is an inorganic semiconductor. If we do the same thing for an organic semiconductor, then um, there are some things to note which are different. One is that the, um, the, 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 the components, the, the, the molecules which make up our, our material are, are usually organized in a disordered manner than, rather than in a crystal. Um, and that will give rise not exactly to a band structure, but rather to some um, uh, arrangement of different, some delocal, some, some variation in the energy of the states that the charges can occupy. But in the end, it will give rise to some type of density of states where you have states that may be occupied and states that may not. And when we convert the language in the organic semiconductor, usually um, we can equate the filled levels with the HOMO and um, with levels uh, up to and including the highest occupied molecular orbital or the HOMO. And we can associate the conduction band with those levels that lie above it. And between them, there would be an energy gap. It may be called the band gap and um, it may be called an optical gap. But this is the important thing. Uh, the important uh, first condition for photovoltaic energy conversion is it can absorb light in a material that has a gap. We will come back later to organic semiconductors, but for the moment, 
I'm going to stick with how we can use the semiconductor to achieve photovoltaic energy conversion. So um, I want to introduce a, a sort of a, an, an important concept here. Um, we will consider it a little bit now, and then it will come back again tomorrow. <laughs> and this is the concept of um, the Fermi levels and quasi-Fermi levels. So um, when our semiconductor is at equilibrium, it will have a, there will be a level up until which um, uh, char uh, energy levels are occupied and above which they're not. We call this the Fermi level. If we have an intrinsic semiconductor, it lies in the middle of this energy gap. And um, at, at finite temperature, there would be a small uh, number of states in the conduction band that are occupied and a small number of states in the valence band, which are not occupied by electrons, and therefore they're occupied by holes. And so we can we can define how many charge carriers are there in equilibrium in the dark. It should be not many, but then when we expose our materials to light, then that will promote some electrons from valence band to conduction band that amplifies the population of both electrons and holes. And then, um, we can quantify those populations by referring them to Fermi levels, except now we have one Fermi level for the electrons and another one for the holes. Strictly speaking, they're not actually Fermi levels anymore. They're quasi-Fermi levels. Um, but it's, it's, it's an energy that indicates the population of charge carriers. Um, electrons in the conduction band and the one for holes indicates the density of holes in the valence bands. And these quantities are important for the uh, identification of the voltage which is generated by solar cells. So it's quite an important concept. So in the dark, a Fermi level is um, well defined and unique. And when you bias a semiconductor, it's not any longer at equilibrium. Um, you start populating um, the conduction band more, uh, but, the, but provided that the charge carriers stay in, those, in, in the bands for, 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 for long enough to relax locally, they can define a local quasi-Fermi level. So this is a kind of, if you don't know the concept, it's maybe a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, not so intuitive to begin with, but it will be very important when we want to try to define the, um, the, um, the, 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 the output, the voltage output of our solar cell. So I, I show this in the case of the typical kind of textbook semiconductor will have a, a very sharp edge of the density of states for both um, conduction band and valence band. Uh, in the case of organic semiconductors, they tend to be more disordered and we may have a rather more um, curved or tail of states that extend into the band gap. And then if that's the case, there will be a different relationship between the charge carrier density and the quasi-Fermi level, one that pays attention to the shape of this tail of states. But basically, the situation is quite analogous. So one thing that is important about this concept of a Fermi level, the concept of equilibrium, is it means that we can take many different materials and compare them um, in terms of their energetics at equilibrium. So if we take the first thing on the left here, this is an intrinsic semiconductor, um, the Fermi level. So all these, all these materials are in the dark in equilibrium. Um, and for the first case, we consider an, in, uh, an intrinsic semiconductor, and the Fermi level lies in the middle of a band gap. But we could change the composition of that semiconductor by introducing some impurity atoms which are electron rich. And they have the effect of sort of depositing more electrons into the conduction band at equilibrium. And the effect of that is to move the Fermi level closer to the conduction band. Alternatively, you could uh, dope it with impurities that are electron poor, and that would have the opposite effect. It would deplete the valence band of electrons and push the Fermi level closer to the valence band. 
Um, and uh, and these and these sort of introducing some chemical impurity or some chemical composition change to the semiconductor allows you to modulate its energy levels so that you can have uh, materials that, if, if you like, are kind of more attractive to electrons or less attractive to electrons by changing their chemical composition. And then when we consider um, uh, metals, they also um, have the, the Fermi level in the case of a metal is the thing which defines how easy it is to remove an electron. And if you have a, a, a metal which has a, a high, um, which, is, which has got, if you like, a, a, is easy, where it's easy to remove um, an electron, for example, barium or calcium, and uh, the Fermi level is close to vacuum, and we say it has a small work function. But if you have something where it's very difficult to remove the electron, like platinum or palladium, that has a deep work function, the Fermi level is far from vacuum. So if we were to try and line up all of these things with the same Fermi level, these different materials, you can see that there are some variations in where the band edges sit. And this is very important because if you remember, what we need for photovoltaic energy conversion is not only an energy gap, but we also need a direction. And the way we introduce a direction is by using chemically different materials on either side of our layer of semiconductor. So the way that's done, typically for your conventional inorganic solar cell, is by having, if we could go back here for a moment, we looked here at the case where you doped a semiconductor N-type and you dope it P-type. Um, and you can see that there is a, that if we then bring those two semiconductors together, there is going to be an offset um, in the energy levels between the materials on the N-type side and the P-type side. So here we have it here. I just moved them around. <laughs> um, but you can see that there is, when we plot the energy, there's a, there's a gradient. And that's something which provides a direction. So with this thing, we call it the PN junction. Um, there is a, a direction um, that comes about because of the asymmetry. It's the same semiconductor, basically, on the left and the right-hand side of the junction, but one of them has got impurities that make it electron-rich, and the other one has impurities that make it electron-poor, and those small concentrations of impurities have a big effect on the energetics. So that if you now introduce another electron with light, um, you come along with a light, you promote an electron um, across uh, from the valence band to the conduction band, it will now be in an environment where it, it has some uh, tendency to move to the right because it's more energetically favorable for the electron to go to the right. And this is the direction, this is what we need to make a solar cell. So this is what you do if you can dope semiconductors. What do you do if you can't dope semiconductors? So in that case, you can use the fact that um, different metals have different work functions. And if you were to, um, sorry, uh, my <laughs> image is, uh, my animation is slightly out of, out of, out of, out of skew. So in the case where, where we didn't have, um, we didn't have a doped semiconductor, but we simply had an intrinsic one, we can still make a junction if we embed that intrinsic material between um, uh, others which have got a high work function and a low work function. So that could be P and N layers of semiconductor, or they could just be a high work function and a low work function metal. So if we put together high work function, intrinsic semiconductor, low work function, and you line them up so that these Fermi levels, this one and this one and this one all line up, you can see that's going to introduce tilt in the energy levels like this. And so here is um, uh, one side. This is the side which is uh, attractive to positive charge. This is the side which is attractive to negative charge. And if we come along with a photon and we excite a charge carrier in this region, the electron will tend to drift to the right and the hole will tend to drift to the left. And so, so sorry, sorry, Jenny, I had yes. 
uh, one quick uh, question about the the Fermi level being constant. So I was just wondering when you you know deposit contact, you know any any metal contact, is there any influence on Fermi level of a semiconductor, or there is no absolutely no no influence on Fermi level of a semiconductor? So what I mean to say, you are putting contacts to collect the charge carriers. So you yes. have metal semiconductor interface. Yes. Interface does that influence Fermi level of the semiconductor? So, so it it will so it should in it, it well of course let, let, let's assume we we don't have any chemistry going on. Okay. Um, <laughs> so so we don't have any. I mean, okay, you, you could in practice, of course, deposit a material and another material, and you could have a reaction, and you make something else. But let's not consider that. Um. What, what will happen, and I mean, it's kind of illustrated to some extent in, in the diagram here, um, it won't affect the, the Fermi level of the semiconductor in, in the bulk, but close to the contacts, there, there needs to be some re-adjustment of charge uh, in order to line up the, the energy level. So, so when you... Um, you know, when, when the Fermi levels sort of uh, align with each other, um, you will end up with a situation where one side is very electron rich relative to the other, and then there will tend to be some uh, exchange. So some uh, electrons may leave the metal and go into the semiconductor, and then you have a thin layer of the semiconductor, which is very, very electron rich. And in that region, um, its bands will, will bend, so it will behave more like an N-type doped semiconductor for a small region of its space because electrons have been injected from the metal. And similarly, at, at a contact between um, a metal which is relatively electron poor, you could have um, hole injection um, into the semiconductor and an equivalent bending of the bands. So in, in the diagram here, it's not, not terribly clear, but I think you can see that the the bands are kind of bending um, a little bit towards the end, and, and, and that is anticipating and um, that they're making a contact with, with something which is which has a different electron density. So thank you. It's okay? Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Okay. And 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 actually um I, I should say, of course, I'm ha I, I, I'm happy to be interrupted and have questions at any point. I'm not quite sure how it's physically done. <laughs> Um, but but uh, but you know so <laughs> I carry on. So th this is our kind of you know if you like the sort of device physics background. Okay, so um, how are we going to do electrical work? So we've got the conditions we needed. We wanted a band gap, um, so that you can absorb photons and then you can keep electrons and holes at a sort of uh, at an excess energy for a period of time. And then we needed a direction so that once the electrons have been promoted, they know which way to go. Fine. So, and typically, um, the sort of function is embedded in a PN junction. And this cartoon here is a kind of a schematic of um, what is called a Perl cell, which is a predecessor of something called the PERC cell, P a passivated emitter rear point contact um, cell, which has been which is one of the widely used designs of silicon solar cell. It doesn't matter at all about the details, but but this is just to, to sort of give you an idea of what's happening. So we have our our this is this is just a this is our device. We're in the dark, we're applying no light, we're applying no bias. And if we measure the current and the voltage, hopefully we'll get no current, no voltage, and we have a point at the origin of the current voltage plot. So what happens then when you start shining light on it, if the electrical contacts are still isolated, what happens? So this is our device. It's n-type at the top, p-type at the bottom. And that means that there is um, an electric field which is driving electrons up. <laughs> so when you come in with, with light and you absorb photons in the semiconductor, it will make electron hole pairs and the electrons will drift up, the holes will drift down. And so if you put a voltmeter across, you'll find the top is negatively charged 
and the bottom is positively charged. And we call the voltage, so we would measure a voltage, we'd measure no current because there's no um, uh, a circuit complete, and we would call that uh, voltage the open circuit voltage because that's what you get at open circuit. And if you do this measurement in what we call a standard sun, a very particular spectrum of a standard uh, intensity, then that would be a, the open circuit voltage that you would normally report. Um, fine, but you still haven't got any work. So if we join now join our contacts together, we've got the same thing going on. Photons come in, they generate pairs, they separate. And now um, we're able to drain this um, positive, this negative charge from the top contacts going through the device and, and back to the bottom. The arrow goes the other way because, of course, current is defined to go in the opposite sense of electrons. So the electrons go from the top to bottom and it generates a current and they will drain away. If this is a low resistance contact, they will drain away all of the um, voltage and um, and but they will produce current and we measure the current density. Uh, it has the convention for uh, at least for device physics people, is that the current density from solar cell is always negative. Sometimes in papers, you'll see this type of graph the other way around where the current is positive. It's just a matter of convention, but for the moment we will uh, treat it as negative. This is the current density. Still, we have current with no voltage. Sorry, can can mute please? Sorry, Jenny, sorry. Everyone, can you please mute? It's my request. Thank you. Okay, please go ahead. Um, so, so, so we still don't have it. We still haven't generated any, any, any power. Um, and then what we need to do to generate power is to put a load between the top and the bottom contacts of the solar cell. And then as the current passes through, it drops resistance and work is done. And depending upon the resistance of the load, we can find some different points on the current voltage characteristic of the solar cell. And at some particular resistance, um, the power, which is the product of the current and the voltage will be maximized. And that is what we would consider to be the power density output of the solar cell. Um, so if we look at that in, in, a, in a slightly different, um, a different format, so we're coming back to the the, the band picture here, and now we're, we, we're, we're considered this position, this operating point, where you have, um, you have light coming in, and you have a resistive load between the two contacts of the device, which will generate, which will present, it will, it will prevent um, the, the charge carriers from draining away completely, so it will maintain some potential difference, some difference in the quasi-Fermi level of the electrons at the end contact and the holes at the P contact. And that will register as the electric charge times the voltage generated by the solar cell. So this situation comes about because of a competition. And it's a competition between uh, electrons that have been photogenerated and are trying to get out and electrons that are being pushed back, if you like, because of this resistive load. So these two will, will, will compete with each other. And whenever the device is in operating condition, the green one wins. And, um, and, and, uh, and, and that you know, gives rise to the current voltage we looked at. Now, a, a way of looking at this situation, if you deal with, and you often will see this, um, is as an equivalent circuit where you have the this, this simple, so if you, if you deal with electronics, you, you deal with, um, with, with circuit diagrams and you can represent the solar cell as being a two, two components in parallel. One of them is simply a diode and that results directly from the fact that you have these asymmetric contacts on your semiconductor device. And then in parallel with that, you've got a constant source of current, a current generator. So one of them is pushing, pushing current one way, the other one is pushing the current the other way. And that gives you a balance. And depending upon the, um, the, the voltage between the contacts, um, the, uh, the current generation may be winning or the diode may be winning. We can also write it down in, in simple as, a, as a simple equation. 
um, where you simply have the sum of the current which is generated um, by the light and acting against it, a current going the other direction, which we may call the diode current or more commonly with solar cells, we call it the dark current. And that dark current increases exponentially with voltage because of this, it, the, the, because uh, as you um, as you reduce the amount of asymmetry in the semiconductor, the ability of the current to flow back across the barrier increases exponentially. So we have this kind of battle between the photocurrent and the dark current. And um, if we choose um, to a, a voltage, which is if we if we apply a resistance, um, uh, if, 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 we, 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 if, 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 if we if we choose a resistance carefully, we can um, uh, we, we can we can maximize the, the product of the current and voltage that we get out. So that would be product of current density times voltage that would give us a maximum power at some point. And then some important definitions. So the power conversion efficiency of the solar cell is a product of the current and the voltage at the maximum power point, and that's as a ratio of the power which came from the sun, which is typically 1,000 watts per square centimeter. So this is this is this is this is this is a, a quantity that we're going to uh, come back to, um, and uh, another quantity which is worth defining at this point is something called the, the fill factor. It's worth mentioning because fill factors uh, in organic solar cells are generally rather poor. Um, uh, compared to the very best, although they have been getting better, the fill factor is kind of it's 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 it's, it's if you like it's a factor of convenience, but it's the ratio of JM uh, VM times JS over JSC VOC, and it's telling you in in a kind of qualitative sense how much like a square this current voltage curve is. So if you have a very bad fill factor, your blue curve might look like that. And if you have an excellent fill factor, it might look like the picture here. So um, to, to, to sort of this is, I think, almost my 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 uh, last slide on the sort of uh, sort of classical solar cells. And um, so if we then we then so we've, we've looked at how we get this um, asymmetry and how we get the direction. And in the last slide, I'm showing you, OK, we can consider at the level of an equivalent circuit. You've got these two processes going on, a constant light dependent photocurrent and against that a voltage dependent a dark current that goes the other way. And they will balance each other exactly at open circuit. Um, and if you apply a load, you can get it to do work and so on and so forth. But, but how would you relate these quantities to the properties of the materials? Well, to do that, you need to treat it with device physics. And um, device physics basically is a process of solving a load of coupled uh, partial differential equations. But we can think about them in, in, in some sort of in terms of really three things that we need to take care of. We consider, we consider we're at steady state, we have light shining, and then what happens? So first thing is light shining, you generate charge carriers, some of those charge carriers recombine, other charge carriers move. And altogether in the steady state, um, those things should add up. And we call that the continuity equation, and it's telling us that the flux of charge carriers at any point in the solar cell is balanced by the difference between how many were generated and how many were recombined in that element. Then another thing that we need is how the current depends on the charge carrier density. And it does in two ways. So one is that a current will flow when there is a concentration gradient, we call it diffusion, and the diffusion coefficient of the material controls that. The other thing is that the current um, will flow in response to an electric field. So we have a drift and a diffusion term in the current density. And that's it. sort of second, if you like, a piece of information or rule that we need. And the third one we need is that we need to satisfy electrostatics. So we need to obey um, Gauss's law 
uh, Poisson's equation, which will tell us how the local electric field depends on the charge carrier density and, and then how the electrostatic potential, which varies from side to side, um, is related to the electric field. So those are kind of laws of, of physics and what controls how, how it's, how, you know, exactly how that happens in any semiconductor, it will depend on the dielectric constant, the permittivity of that material. So, so, so what do we, what can we say in the classical solar cell? First of all, for this continuity equation, we can say the generation is equal um, more or less to the local photon absorption. Every time you absorb a photon, you straight away generate an electron and a hole, and they're free. It's an approximation which is quite good for classical semiconductors. Recombination, um, that happens when electron and hole come together, or it might happen through a defect when it'll depend on uh, the density of defects and, and the local density of electrons or holes. Then in terms of controlling the, the current, or if you like, the transport of charges, we then, then what matters will be some properties of the semiconductor, its mobility and diffusion coefficient. And so those will tend to be high for a crystal, for gallium arsenide, for example, they're super high. For a defective material, they're not so high. Um, and then the electrostatics aren't strongly influenced by the local dielectric constant. So these are some of the, the physical things that matter and will control um, the form of the current voltage curve that you finally get up. Okay, so um, we then, in the end, what we care about will be the efficiency. And that's how much work you get out at the optimum point when you've applied the optimum resistance compared to the radiant power received from the sun. And so what you get out is this current voltage product for your solar cell, the maximum um, current voltage product, and what you put in is simply the, the power in the sun. So we can now look at efficiencies of some different solar cells. There's a lot of different families here, and most of what I've been talking about would apply to the blue family here, which are uh, silicon solar cells. But there are other materials and um, uh, maybe just to 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 get to, to to sort of fill in the, the, the gaps that the purple family here these are all um approaches to solar cells where either the light is concentrated or there are multiple materials or multiple junction solar cells and those are ways of improving the efficiency above the limit for a single material and um, the green ones are inorganic thin films and then the orange ones are what we're going to go on to talk about, organic materials and perovskite materials. And the thing maybe to pay attention to is down here in the bottom right hand corner of the organic family, we see that, sorry, my, my, um, my image is, is over the, um, the, the time scale here, but this is a kind of 2021 result that the efficiencies of organic solar cells have jumped up from being around about 11 or 12 percent to being over 17 percent and this is something which is very interesting and i guess it's uh, wh why we're here today so we're going to go on to try to understand um why are these efficiencies not higher and how can how high can they get in the end this is what we're interested in um, I wonder if maybe at this point I should invite any questions on the previous part before I go on to yes. a different yeah. family of semiconductors. That's true. Yes, yes, yes. Any questions from students and attendees, please. Okay, well. Too much physics, not enough chemistry. No, no. I, <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, yeah, it could be. Yes. Yeah, so. I, I think uh, maybe it's just taking some time, but um, I guess I guess one question I have, Jenny, um, I just would like to get a little bit of a clarification. The dark current, could you just enumerate more, a little bit more about the dark current in the circuit? And just uh, uh, how does one think about it um, in terms of, 
um, the connections in the actual device and um, maybe just a physical picture of that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to use this picture just for the for the purpose. Yeah. So this is how we so we, we consider here these are kind of the energy band uh, profiles in, in equilibrium. In equilibrium, the, the Fermi level um, between is controlled by the um, the two contact materials. Right. And um, if we now if we go into the dark. Uh, and, and when we talk about dark current, we almost always refer to dark current in forward bias, <laughs> yes, yes. which means that you're you're acting against this built-in bias. So bias. here there's a kind of gradient, which is encouraging electrons to go to the left in this picture. Now, if we apply a, a dark, if we if we apply a bias to it in the dark, we will be pushing up this blue electrode relative to the red one. Right. And these energy levels are pinned to the electrode. So if you push up the blue electrode, we're going to make those bands more flat. Right. And if you consider this situation from the point of view of an electron, which is sitting on the blue electrode material, um, at the moment, it doesn't really want to go to the right because it has to go uh, uphill. It needs some yes. energy. Yes. But if you push that blue electrode up, it's going to make it easier. Correct. for the electrons to to travel yeah. to the right Correct. and the kind of the you know the the the, the thing is that uh, as we make the, so if you like it has a barrier you push that up the barrier will get smaller and when the barrier gets smaller the electrons will flood across and so it's quite a dramatic effect that you have a a, a sort of a, a flux that will increase exponentially with with the amount of a potential energy by which you push up that electrode and that's a diode current and the reason it goes up exponentially is because of Boltzmann statistics right. so um the you know the energy of an electron will uh, uh, decay with increasing energy like e to the minus e over kt if we make a barrier smaller then it will increase um the density of electrons at that level uh, exponentially. So we have a very profound effect. We push this up, electrons flood over, um, and you have an exponential increase in current, which is going the wrong way. So wrong the electrons way. would, yeah. 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 Photocurrent goes that way, electric current go that way. Yeah. Why we bring the current, the dark current in is because as soon as you have current being generated and you have a resistive load between the contacts, then that generates a bias between these two contacts, which is working the wrong way. Correct. So it's kind of like like a reaction. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. That's a very nice. I have. I have maybe, yeah. Can I? Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. So this uh, electrostatics, this in, in your slide, uh, this epsilon r has a profound uh, effect on a diffusion coefficient. Uh, it's essentially how how you dissociate, right? So this is uh, in a Conventional semiconductor, these mott vinyl excitons, uh, uh, because of the high dielectric constant, you see that the, the delocalization lengths are larger. So I just wonder, you know, what happens after doping you know, to this uh, electrostatics in semiconductor? Is that uh, you have more carrier density, and does that has any correlation with the uh, epsilon r values? Sure, sure. I mean, it. it I mean, I. I think I'm. I'm going to 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 struggle to find numbers, yeah. <laughs> of, of hand to, to answer the question. But the, yes. I mean, the 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 general effect will be that the, the higher the density of of uh, mobile uh, free carriers, then the greater the effect of screening. So it would would it would have, an effect of improving screening. Okay. So it would have an effect like increasing uh, epsilon r but I, I i can only say that's physically what i would expect but i i i'm afraid i can't um for the for the for example for the silicon solar cell or something i, I can't give you a number what, what i can say is that in thing in or in um, inorganic semiconductors normally epsilon r is typically 10 that's large enough that 
um, any electron hole pair will dissociate at room temperature. And so we tend not to care too much about what the additional screening effect would be of free charge carriers. And moreover, once you have a high epsilon R, the additional screening effect is not so profound. But it would be important in a low epsilon material. Good. I think Professor Nagafani has a question. Fani, please go ahead. Uh, uh, hey, uh, th thanks a lot for a wonderful uh, introductory uh, section here. Uh, uh, regarding the mobility part where you put in mu n, right? Would you take the band mobility for that value or would you be interested in the field mobility? And if it's the latter, it would be in, in some sense be related to the diffuse, uh, diffusion coefficient of the electrons anyways. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what I present here is 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 really at, at quite a, a simple level. So I'm I'm supposing that you know within a device physics picture, we we would could consider that, um, you know, charge carriers have a mobility. Typically, we would be working with a one dimensional system, and so it would be the mobility in the you know the direction of the field. In a more proper consideration, maybe we should have a mobility tensor. Um, but usually it's, it'll be the, the field will be applied in that direction. Um, we would, in, in the simplest case, the mobility and the diffusion coefficient will be related through the Einstein relation. Um, and you asked, would it be the band in mobility or the field mobility? Um, do you mean field effect mobility? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, essentially the question is, yeah, are we talking about the drift mobilities here? which yeah. I think is what we are probably considering. And therefore, yeah. those should be connected to the diffusion coefficient. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's a, it's a drift. It, it is, yes, that's right. So it, so it is, so, so I mean, formally, what it is, it's a coefficient of the, you know, carrier flux in a, a field of a given strength. So it's a coefficient of the electric field. And it's, so it's a drift. By definition, it's a drift mobility that goes in there. Okay, thank you. Anshuman? Anshuman? Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, ongoing discussion. And uh, so uh, I'm just trying to connect. Uh, we know that uh, when the short circuit current, for example, increases, uh, the uh, open circuit voltage also increases. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, just unable to see the physical picture of it. If you can help me to see the physical picture of uh, this. Yeah, so when the, yep, um, let me see if I can. Um, so you, you, the, the question is, why does voltage increase when inten right. light intensity increases? Is that right? Uh, he was uh, saying I think short circuit current. Am I correct, Anshuman? Yeah, yeah. He was saying that enhancement in short circuit current also increases the open circuit voltage. But I think yes. at the light intensity increases the short. But it's the light current. intensity yeah. that increases the short circuit current. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah. So so I mean th this I mean this page might be so th there would be a more detailed explanation, but I'm going to try and give something sh short because it would fit with the page that we're on. So um at so the Let's consider since consider this first equation, which is a continuity equation. Um, consider you that you are at short circuit. Yeah. Um, so a short circuit recombination doesn't matter very much. So you can get rid of R. Um, and then your current that comes through one of the electrodes would be the generation integrated over the thickness. Yeah. So if you increase the generation, you would increase the current more or less proportionally to a first approximation, double the light, you double the current. Yeah. So what's going to happen to open circuit voltage? Well, if, you, if you're at open circuit voltage, then there's no longer, well, to, to some approximation, there's no longer, uh, there, there will be some variation in current, but we consider it less. But we then, recombination is important and we now have some balance between generation and recombination. Um, and there will be a charge carrier density that makes that balance possible. So if we consider that recombination um, will be 
uh, charges. So we, we generate charges and they recombine. And let's say they recombine with a given lifetime. Then if you double the generation, you would to an approximation, <laughs> uh, double the charge carrier. Uh, let me see if I'm going, I'm going to, am I going to get tangled up in this? Um, what I want to say is that the balance, if you increase the, the, the generation rate, the balance between generation and recombination uh, changes. Um, mm -mm -mm. Oh, God. I, I, I Actually, this is not the best way to show it. It's going to be, sorry. Sorry, Auntie Man. I'm going to backtrack on myself and go back here for a moment. Um, this is easier. Okay, this is easier. Put, put, delete, delete the last thing I said from from YouTube. Right, and um, the the right. We increase the light intensity. We increase JSC. Okay, and um, we've always got this tension, this competition between the photogeneration and the recombination. A dark current is basically recombination, right? And um, and in at open circuit, the left hand side is zero, so these two are uh, matching. So we, we have, if we increase, if, we, if J0, so if your material, your device stays the same, nothing changes, J0 stays the same, but we double the light intensity, we double JSC, and then in order for these two terms to cancel each other out exactly, then if this has been doubled, then this exponential term needs to have increased as well. And for that to have increased, then the value of V that open circuit needs to have increased as well. Yeah. So if you if you if you rearrange this this equation so that you have a um, recombination and a generation are um, you know dark current and forward current are balancing each other out, they, they can only balance if you increase the voltage. And what it basically means, kind of at an intuitive sort of level. Um, you have generation, 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 and then charge carriers recombine, recombine. Um, but if you increase the rate of generation, um, then you, you're kind of, you're increasing the, 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 the density of charge carriers which, which, are, which are there. And the density of charge carriers, I mentioned earlier on the Fermi levels, if you increase the density of electrons in the holes, you will also push apart the quasi Fermi levels that control that sort of indicate their 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 populations, and that would improve, improve the open circuit voltage. So this is another way of, of looking at it. But in the equation on the next slide, I didn't have anything there that could connect it to the to the voltage. Yeah, I, I got it. The quasi permeable shifting is a, a pretty clear physical picture. It provided me the physical yeah. picture. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank yeah. Thank you. So does okay. anyone has? Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone has? Uh, Shuman is okay. There is there is Pavitra. Pavitra wanted to ask the question. Hi, Jenny. Uh, this is Pavitra here. I have a very quick question regarding hill factor. I think you touch upon this short circuit current, the open circuit voltage. I think. Should also explain that uh, why you have a curvature there in that uh, JV curve and what determines the field factor in a particular solar cell and uh, and whether the band gap has something to do with that or the contacts or the doping levels, what plays uh, the role uh, determining the field factor? Um, that's quite a lot of questions. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into, into 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 all of it just now because some of it is going to come up late, later on and mm -hmm. um, the I mean the fill, I mean I might just go back to this to the slide where we, we defined the fill factor um, and and I said here that the, the fill factor is is the, the the ratio of you know the power to JSC VOC and in a way it's connected to the curvature. So in for an ideal solar cell, the fill fact there will always be some curvature here, um, and that curvature. I mean, uh, one sort of way to think about it is the fact that you basically it results from the difference between a constant quantity and an exponential quantity, and that's a function which is going to be curved. So this is like constant, constant plus an exponential. 
Um, so in the ideal case, um, sort of our, you know, thermal st carrier statistics, thermodynamics are controlling the fact that there is a curvature here. If we went to very extreme situations where we had a very, very, very blue sun and we were at a very, very, very high temperature, I think, uh, then you might get a, a square field factor, but we're not in, in those conditions. But then in real life, this um, quantity is is not so, this curve is not usually so, so good. Um, and the reasons why the, the, the fill factor in a real device would not um, reach the ideal, um, ideal shape would usually be to do with the fact that at um, the, uh, the, 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 the sort of the at voltages which are close to open circuit, the charge carrier uh, transport or collection is not fast enough compared to the combination. So, I mean, th there could be other reasons. So you might have a leaky device um, or you might have some parasitic resistances in the system, which would affect this. But if your resistances are fine and there's no leaks, then usually the thing which limits the fill factor is the fact that, um, so this ideal picture is kind of pretending that you still continue to collect all photogenerated charge carriers even when your voltage approach is a VOC. But in, in fact, in practice, and particularly with organic solar cells, that may not be the case. If the mobilities of the charge carriers are not great, then whenever the uh, voltage becomes high, the field becomes weak, and um, the charge carrier uh, transport becomes, or collection becomes slower, and then this will fall. So this curve might then look more like that. And um, that's typically indicating that, that, recomb that at the operating point, recombination is becoming important, more important than in the ideal picture. Thank you, Jenny. Is, is, is that, is it, is it, does, that, does that answer you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jenny. OK. Shall I continue? Yeah, please go ahead, Jenny. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so now we're going to move on to, to organic semiconductors. And um, I, 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 I'm, I'm guessing that uh, this, this uh, audience knows <laughs> about organic semiconductors, but just to, to introduce sort of, you know, how I define them, at least from a point of view of the sort of, of the device physics person, um, with semiconductors, um, and they have, semiconducting properties, which, which I will define as an um, ability to absorb visible light, possessing an energy gap or a band gap, and capable of transporting um, electrons and holes. And they have those properties thanks to a, a backbone almost universally. There's a structural um, a commonality, which is you have a network of carbon atoms, which are in the sp2 configuration, and the pi electrons associated with that a hybridization and um, form a network. And those pi electrons are the ones that can be excited with visible light. Those are the ones that can move. So our, our um, carbon-based semiconductors have got semiconductor properties. Um, and it's the sort of pi conjugation um, uh, that gives rise to this extended network of pi electrons. And we can work out some density of states for any molecule. And, and the occupied states will be filled up until the HOMO, and then we'll have some gap that might be a few, um, one, two, three electron volts, and then we have HOMO. Um, so we have electronic and optical properties due to the pi electrons. And why we would be interested in them, um, because they're uh, relatively easy to process, and the properties can be controlled, uh, through by changing the, the chemistry of the materials, and um, we can process them into soft solids, process them in a similar way to other plastics, and you could prepare them in a lot of different phases. Um, those are things that could make them quite interesting for, for, for application to, to solar photovoltaics. So, so these are some of, some of the reasons why we would like to use organic semiconductors for solar cells. Um, 
of course, they are, you know, intrinsically abundant materials, um, and they're, uh, apart from that, relatively, uh, not, not much energy needs to be invested either in synthesis or, or, or processing of the material. So those are kind of, so, so they're, if you like, low energy, um, uh, low, low process energy, low embedded energy materials. They're tunable, they're flexible. And as well as that, they're quite, you know, always one of the things that's always quite appealing is, is the fact that we have some parallels with how they work. And we'll see this as we go through the lectures um, and, and how, um, uh, how natural systems work. So the diagrams on the left, this is a kind of a, an image of processes in the reaction center of photosystem two. And they can be represented by a state diagram where we have a number of different uh, transitions going on whenever light is, is shown. And then the right is the type of picture that we would use to describe the processes in an organic solar cell. There's a lot of commonality between them. And, um, and so it's kind of, there, there is that a sort of appealing that nature found a way to convert solar energy um, using molecular transitions. And it's also what we're trying to do with our organic solar cells. So that's one reason. And then another reason is that actually they have been performing re remarkably quite well. So the kind of the, the typical uh, photovoltaic device is something where you have uh, organic semiconductors between two different work function contacts. One of the uh, contacts needs to be accessible to light. And um, as over the time that um, uh, I, for example, have been working in this field, we've seen uh, a variety of new materials be introduced or be applied to the to this pro to this um, to this uh, process. And when I, I started working in this field um, around about the 2.5 percent point, um, when polyphenylene vinylene was the the semiconductor that was used. And then the problem with that was it only absorbed in the blue, with the green, and then other materials were found that could absorb further into the um, red, into the infrared, with more betterly spaced energy levels, with better microstructural properties, and so on. And so over the kind of the, that that period, there was big improvements in the efficiency of organic solar cells. We come back to all of that later, but just there have been improvements that are driven by materials. And then recently, what's been very exciting is that we always used the same acceptor, which was fullerene, as sometimes we used C17. And then recently, and that's really within the last five years or so, we've seen a switch from those fullerenes, which were limiting in some ways to alternative acceptors, um, like Y6, for example, and they have shot up the efficiency to over 18%. And so this, this um, graph here is kind of showing um, how the efficiencies have, have increased. Um, and the, um, the red stars are sort of tracking um, some of what's been happening on this diagram. So one reason for anybody to be interested in these sort of um, both sort of scientifically as well as sort of for possible application is the fact that there's been just this remarkable improvement in performance and we would all like to understand what drove it and how far can it carry on going. <laughs> so, so, so just that's a quick, that, just a quick clarification, Jenny. Sure. There's a question in the chat by Ronnie who is asking what is ECS? So the energy of the uh, chart separate state or what? I'm, what I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. It's, yeah. I'm sorry. It, I, I, my, my apologies. Uh, ECS is the energy of the charge separated state. Yes. So effectively the, the voltage it's, it's um, yeah, we, 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 I think we come back to that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so then, so, so then let's, let's, let's look at, look at the properties of our organic semiconductors. Um, and particularly things that, um, that might be different compared to uh, other semiconductors. So, so importantly, um, so we, we can have small molecules, we can have conjugated polymers. Um, and uh, in either case, the electronic state, and that may be um, a photo excited state, it may be a charged state, they tend to be localized. So with a small molecule, the state, so they'd be localized over maybe some tens of um, of 
of uh, carbon, uh, uh, sp2 carbon atoms. And in the case of, a, of what we call a small molecule, um, some people would say these are not small molecules, but, but <laughs> a molecule of, let's say, some ten, tens to hundreds of atoms, uh, the, the states will be localized over, delocalized over one of those molecules uh, in some way. When we get to a conjugated polymer, then the electronic state will be localized over a segment of the polymer, but um, not over the whole material. So you have some spatial localization of the electronic states. They're not completely extended in K space as they would be for an inorganic crystal. And consequences of that are, so the photo excited states, the excitons, for example, are localized. And um, Satish mentioned, and some of you will have seen Frank Spano's lecture, um, where he's talking about um, excited states in um, organic semiconductors. And the, our, our um, uh, uh, excitons are, are, are typically Frenkel excitons that will be localized in a small volume of space, partly by the, um, the sort of dielectric properties, partly by the electron phonon interactions in this soft molecule, and partly by the fact that the material is actually disordered. So excited states are localized, and moreover, charged states are also localized, and that gives rise to low mobility. And as well as the localization, we have the fact that because these are soft materials, they're not strongly directed by any intra intermolecular forces. They're usually processed from solution that introduces, introduces a lot of um, disorder in the process. You tend to end up with materials that are uh, structurally disordered in the way they're organized, and that gives rise to disorder in the energy of the state. So, for example, if you consider the different segments that may be made up um, by a conjugated polymer in some conformation, there will be some where that are uh, where you have a, a sort of a very compressed, very small conjugated segment that will have a high energy for the electrons and holes that sit there, and others that may have very extended segments, and then the energy will be lower. So you'll have some variation in energy that's connected, directly connected to the uh, way the, the molecules are organized. So I'm going to go through the differences kind of uh, one by one, <laughs> uh, very quite quickly, to to come to the design of an organic solar cell. So we talked about inorganic semiconductors and organic semiconductors, and, and I mentioned it briefly earlier on, but just to sort of focus a little bit on, on this idea. So with an inorganic semiconductor, typically we think about our material as being a crystal, being based on, the physics is all based on the physics of crystals, periodic material, um, uh, the the uh, states that electrons and holes can occupy are completely extended in space and they form some band structure and there would be gaps in that band structure, one of which is the gap between the valence band and the conduction band. Whereas in our organic semiconductor, uh, the way the materials are organized is much less ordered and there will be energy levels that can be occupied, but they don't extend infinitely in space. They will be localized on a molecule, on a segment, and they will have different energies. And you still have a distinction between those um, occupied uh, molecular orbitals and unoccupied ones, but there is no longer this well-defined band structure normally. There, there are some organic crystals, but, but they're not usually the materials we, we work with for solar cells. So then what else is different? So, in the inorganic semiconductor, when you generate, when you excite an electron from valence to conduction band, we, as I mentioned before, spontaneously get a charge pair. When we do it in the in the organic semiconductor, we generate um, a charge pair. But in the in the immediate sense, this is a not a separated pair, but it's an exciton. It's a Frenkel exciton, and the electron hole are attached to each other. Um, and localized relative to their environment by some, typically some deformation of the surroundings. And if we think of, at it, look at it from sort of a basic physical perspective. Oh, Jenny, the, the, sorry, uh, Vivek, yeah, of course. Yeah, Vivek has a question. Vivek, please go ahead. Hi, uh, I should just had a quick question about the uh, right hand part, or even I guess uh, both parts of the slide. So when we, you know, when we think about the dielectric constant here, 
uh, we are thinking about you know the uh, I guess the low frequency dielectric constant. Whereas during the excitation, it's really the optical dielectric constant that you know that that screens out uh, the interaction. So, uh, do, for example, you know. Um, uh, even you know you give the example of photosynthesis where also you know the charge separation happens really, you know pretty fast within a few femtoseconds uh, mm -hmm. after optical excitation and really there you know we are thinking about the optical uh, you know high frequency part of the dielectric constant so so uh, with that like uh, i guess my question is uh, like how much or, or like how much do should we think about the dielectric constant here uh, when thinking about you know, in an organic semiconductor, I create an exciton, and I'm thinking about you know the first tens of femtoseconds where it dissociates. Uh, yeah. So I mean, I mean, I think I think um, the so the, the it, it, it's certainly true that in the in the in the very first um, uh, moments uh, of of um, photogeneration, and I mean, so this this is a regime which is. Which we can't really look at with with classical physics as a, a, a as a medium or as the only medium. Um, so the the I guess that the, you so so there will be a that there'll be a, a process of um, sort of relaxation of this excited state during which the local dielectric properties change or if you like different different parts of the you know different you know, the, the the relaxation will occur in such a way that it takes you to the regime where high frequency from high frequency to low frequency um, and that would control maybe the length of time it might control the spatial extent of the x ton um but but as it calls um and I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm going to talk about charge separation tomorrow, so I don't want to okay. go a lot into a lot of detail about it now. I mean, what, what I could say is that if we, if we just consider um, the, 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 the place where we know, you know, where we don't, we don't even, so the, uh, although in, for the very fast processes, the high frequency epsilon um, will matter, but nevertheless, um, the performance of the solar cell is also uh, very strongly dependent on the yeah. low frequency dielectric constant because that will also control um, the interactions between the charge carriers, even yeah. when they're cold. Uh -huh. um, and that will, you know, prevent them from escaping from each other um, and, and will sort of uh, determine the capture radius over which an electron and the hole can see each other. So, so it's still... You know, at this level, it, it's quite an important concept. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I, I can see two. I can see two more questions, so I'm going to stop talking and wait for them. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, Fanny, please go ahead. Fanny. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, Jenny. I mean, first, probably uh, it's okay to say that you will uh, cover this tomorrow because this is also a follow up to Vivek's question. Uh, so the two kind of related questions I have is one, is it right to think that the holes and electrons maybe will be screened differently in an organic semiconductor? Is there reason to believe that the dielectric screening will be different for the hole and the electron? Uh, question one. Question two, do we expect any spatial variance uh, in, in how uh, the electron and the hole are screened? And so in that sense, what kind of differences do we see between um, this inorganic versus organic when we consider these two as possibilities. Yeah. So, 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 so I think it's. I think it's. It's certainly possible that the. I mean, the the the, the first question I, I won't go into now. I'm going to think about it before tomorrow, um, and try to give you a, a an answer then. For the second part of the question about whether there would be spatial variation, then uh, then indeed there, there 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 can certainly be spatial variation. I mean, we we're already. I mean, I haven't said it yet, but we're already working in a material which is contains different components. Um, and donor and acceptor, different materials will have different screening properties. There will be a direction dependence on screening. There probably will be a, a local, you know, packing or crystallization dependence of the dielectric constant. And then the, the phenomenon that, that Satish mentioned earlier is the, the idea that we may actually have some uh, invasion uh, of charge carriers into the, into the device near to the contacts. 
um, that would influence the local dialect of concert. So, that, so we can certainly, so, so you could certainly expect that the dialect of properties may vary um, spatially. That, um, and then the other part I'll try to, about electrons versus holes, I, 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 will, I, will, I will try to think about what my answer is to that before tomorrow. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, Ravi Kishore, please. Ravi Kishore. Hi, Jenny. Yeah, hi, Jenny. Hello. Uh, just to answer the previous question of electron and hole, the effective masses will be different, right, for both? Yeah. So that could have some effect. That's the correct. Yes, yes. I think that's what. But I think she said she will get back to tomorrow. So right, right. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Other come to my question. Uh, now, uh, this uh, what you showed on the right side of the slide. Uh, this sort of a flat diagram. Uh, is it? Uh, uh, is it the complete picture? Is it the complete picture in the sense that in a polymer you have disordered segments which are oriented in different directions? This one. Oh, which, which, sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Ravi. I don't hear your. Yeah, I, I, think I can't hear I you can, per I can, perfectly. I can, I can. I can help. Ravi Kishore, you have a questions on this band diagram, which is the yeah. one. Yeah. So are you which saying one? that? Yeah. Which one? The organic one, right? Yeah, organic one. Organic. So what is the question? Can you please repeat? The question is: Say in a polymer, a disordered polymer. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. So you have uh, the energy levels which are. Uh, are the segments which are oriented in different directions? They're randomly oriented, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah that's correct. That's correct. So, yes. the, so now to draw it in a straight line, okay, and this sort of a picture, is it correct? Uh, so the picture, the picture. I mean, the picture is only trying. I mean, the picture is only a cartoon. It's not. I'm not going to say it's co correct in any way. I mean, the, the thing I want to communicate is is the following, and um, that relative to the inner yeah, I can... conductor. Um, yeah, I can understand you want to show localization and you also so localized show and they're disordered in energy. And that's all Sorry. I'm trying to show. And, and apart from that, there is no significance to draw into the diagram. It's simply showing, trying to show this is how it's different. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. At, at a very simple level. For the <laughs> yes, I think I now don't see anyone. Anyone has questions here? I think funny, your hand is still up. I think you already asked. So anybody else? Let me just yeah. see here. Ravi Kishore already asked the question. I think we are done. So maybe so, you can, yeah, carry on. Carry on, yeah. Yes. So um, electrons hold, attract each other. And um, what's different about transport? Again, using this, this idea that the uh, charge carriers are localized. The um, charge, charge carriers move um, from localized site to localized site in what we will consider as a hopping process, which I come to shortly. Um, you can apply the same physical picture of current to both types of materials, but our coefficients um, are, are different. They'll tend to be lower in the organic material. And moreover, they may no longer be constant. They may now depend on charge carrier density. Um, and then we come to the, the important business, which is um, uh, photo generating charge pairs. So in our, in our inorganic semiconductor, uh, we generate the charge pair spontaneously, and we can say the generation rate is equal to the photon absorption rate. And in the organic system, um, we, we can't. Um, we will generate a, an electron hole pair, the exciton, which will stay together and it may drift, but they would generally stay together. Um, so that means that the amount of charge carriers that we would generate would be a small fraction or a fraction of the number of photons that are absorbed. And how do we deal with that? And the way that's dealt with it is by introducing a, an interface between um, what we call in semiconductor terms, a type two interface between two materials where there's a, a preference for electron to be on one side and holes to be on the other side. And then when you generate the exciton, it may reach an interface, but then dissociate and allow the charge carriers to move in the opposite direction. Um, and with that, with, that, with that approach, then it's possible to generate, uh, to, 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 to convert a large fraction of the photo, photo generated excitons into charged pairs, which we will continue with. So that's, that's the idea. 
Now, um, in terms of the, so this, this, this is the idea we, we have an interface. Now, the, so, so if we take a diagram here on the left, this is kind of the realization of such an interface. Uh, I have a and question. Raghavendra, yeah, please. Go ahead, Raghavendra, can you speak? Yeah, unmute, Raghavendra. You are on mute, actually. Can you please unmute and speak? No. Yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. Ha, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Professor Jerry, Jerry ma'am, please come to the last slide. Uh, can you come to the last slide? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, one question is there, then, after the formation of excite, excitone, they are traveling some distance in the interface. So uh, what is the reason behind their, uh, how they are traveling uh, some distance in interface and after traveling some interface, the uh, charge carrier are going to be separate. So what is the reason behind that, uh, why they are going to be separate? Yeah. So, so the, the so two, I mean, I, I heard two questions. One is why do they travel? And the other was why do they separate? So yes, going yes. back to, to, to this one, in, in my sort of cartoon, I, I, I generate this um, uh, pair and then it, it drifts. So, um, yes, yes. okay, so we, so we have an exciton and it may transfer, the, the excited state can transfer to another molecule, to another molecule, um, and will tend to follow. So, so we tend to have some tendency for the exciton to, to transfer, to diffuse to lower energy states. Um, the the exon, exciton is able to transfer through um, Forrester or Dexter transfer process. So there'll be some probability that that will happen and it will happen up to a point and then it will decay. Um, and there'll be some distance associated with the relative rates of the sort of transfer to a neighboring molecule and decay. And, and so that distance, so there'll be some distance over which an exiton, exiton can diffuse. Um, now, in this diagram here, I have this, I create the exciton, it's able to diffuse, and then it breaks. So why it breaks is because the exciton reaches a point where it is adjacent to another molecule or another domain where um, the, there's a different, it's a different chemical structure. It's more attractive for electrons. It has a deeper lying homo, so higher electron affinity, and the electron would rather be there. Um, and so the, you know, it's presented with the opportunity um, of rather than exciton move to another molecule, exciton break. Um, and the electron to transfer, and this would be energetically favorable. Um, and it, 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 this, this process of, of exciton dissociation appears to compete quite well with the process of um, exciton diffusion. I mean, yes. Yeah. So, so once the exciton reaches an interface, it, at least in the, at least in the materials that we study, and um, which it will empirically have been selected because they do this, and uh, the, the the this dissociation happens. And I mean, it was just mentioned actually in a previous question about how fast the charge separation process happens in in photosynthesis. So we're talking about maybe things that happen on a picosecond uh, or timescales. Um, and it can be, it's the same here, you, you will see this process happening on picosecond timescale, whereas the lifetime of an exciton might be hundreds of picoseconds or maybe a nanosecond. Okay, thank you. I mean, I'm not sure if that really answers why, <laughs> but at least I'll say it's, it's energetically favorable, so it makes sense. Yes, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. And, okay. And some more yes. questions. Yes, yes, Jenny. Um, uh, uh, are there further questions? There are some questions in the chat box, but uh, Satish and I think that maybe we can sort of uh, take those questions after we sort of formally stop. Um, okay. For today, yeah, yeah. So, so if it's if if it's okay, if you can, if you maybe want to summarize or something, and then we will take those further questions. Okay, let, let's do that. I mean, I, I think what I'm going to do is is not do part three. I'll do part three tomorrow. Okay. <laughs>
That's Perfect. fine. Maybe Perfect. you can so, summarize, yeah, summarize today. Maybe you can so, summarize. I'll, I'll, I'll get to the end of part two. So, yeah. um, different types of. Uh, so this is this is where, where I was uh, trying to explain. Actually, the last one of the last questions was helpful for this. Um, uh, so we can introduce this junction in a, in a plainer manner and you could have a solar cell that looks like this. And indeed the first organic solar cell that was reported by Ching Tan in 1986 did look like this. And um, the problem is that the distance over which the exciton will diffuse before it dies is rather small. And importantly, it's small compared to the absorption depth of the organic semiconductor material. Um, and so that means, what that means is that if we consider, so I use the cartoon at the bottom as, as a guide, um, if you have light coming in, it's absorbed in the material, there'll be some generation profile that will fall from side to side of the device. But the photons that are absorbed further from the interface than this typical exciton diffusion length will be wasted. Only those photons that are absorbed close to the interface on either side of it can be used. And so you miss um, a lot of the uh, available light energy. You could make your device very thin, but then you would transmit a lot of light energy. So that would not be useful. And so the, the way around that is to make this mixture of components where you have donor and acceptor mixed together, um, but you still have a percolating network. So in, in general, all of your acceptor components, as long as the, the comp volume compositions are not too different, wherever you generate an electron, it will somehow be connected to the cathode and where you generate a hole, it will somehow be connected to the anode. And then we, we, we then have this mixed, um, mixed medium material where the electronic properties are controlled um, by both. Uh, and and, and then wherever you, you absorb a photon, it's likely to be able to generate a charge. And this is, we call it the Belketra junction. I'm not, there's a lot to say about the material science of that. I wasn't planning to do that, but rather um, I would just look at this. And um, so there's about, there's a couple more slides, but it's just kind of going through these, these steps. So we have the Belketra junction, and then we consider what are the, the key steps in, in the process. So you absorb a photon, Exciton diffuses to the interface. Um, as the uh, exciton reaches the interface, it, it splits uh, momentarily into a charge pair that then needs to separate. And then your separated charges need to get to the contacts and then they will generate the current and the voltage. And this is all the things we like to happen. I've also shown them in a state diagram down here um, where we show we start off with the uh, electrochemical potential uh, embedded in the energy due to the photon. We have some relaxation. We lose some of that energy when charge transfer occurs. Um, we may lose, or may or may not lose some more when charge separation occurs. We lose some more before charges are collected. And um, at every stage, there are competing processes, loss processes. We lose the exciton, we lose the charges, uh, we lose the charges in transport. And, and the competition between red and gray is the competition that will determine the efficiency of the solar cell. Um, so I started off looking at device physics. And if we consider this series of process, some of those are familiar. Um, in a normal solar cell, a classical solar cell, you absorb light, um, charges uh, separate the transport to the contacts, and they may be combined along the way. So these things we could look at with a device model. So I've shown the figure, figure like this for a device model. We can also use it for the organic solar cell. What would we have to change? So the semiconductor, uh, okay, so we may care about optical interference because we're dealing with very thin layers and the material will be disordered. So we tend to have states penetrating into the band gap. Um, generation, we come to it tomorrow, is not yet well understood. Um, recombination is not as straightforward as it is in uh, classical sort of crystalline semiconductors. And of course, a dielectric constant is small. So these are things that are different. But if we wanted to sort of proceed and try to solve our organic solar cell with rate equations, we would need to know what controls G, what controls R and these constants. 
and that's not so well known. So then um, we can look at the processes that are not well covered by a device model. And these really consider the process of what happens to the exciton, what happens at the interface um, when the exciton uh, dissociates and then when the charges separate and the different types of excited state that might be formed uh, that act as loss processes. And these things we can't really consider with device physics, we need to consider them, consider with them and um, consider them as a series of, of molecular transitions. And that is, uh, I think I will finish for today there and move on to this tomorrow and then follow up the molecular transitions with, um, with a discussion of um, how, how we think about the processes of charge separation and recombination at the interface. So these things that happen very locally and very fast, what controls them and um, how they ultimately impact the performance of the solar cell and um, how, if you like, how, how per I don't want to say how perfect can they be. In the end, how, how much are they going to limit um, the, the the performance of the solar cell? How, how you know what might what might we hope for in, in terms of um, improved materials or devices in the future? So maybe I can leave it here and now take yes. other questions from the group. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much. I would like to thank Jenny for this first talk uh, today. And I really would like uh, to open the floor for more questions. Um, there are already a bunch of questions from YouTube, Satish. We have to take a couple of them. Okay. And, and uh, there is also, there are questions in the chat box right now. So um, I think first, first start with uh, some of the student questions, but I just let Santosh ask the question because he has been raising his hand for some time. Uh, Sai Santosh, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Jenny. Thanks for this uh, nice side-by-side -side, uh, comparison between organic and inorganic. It could bring out the, bring out the perspective. Uh, but one thing which uh, intuitively I failed to understand since many years is uh, why is the what is it that is happening at the interface that is, uh, that is coming over the external binding energy in, in organ, inorganic. For the inorganic case, you do have this built-in potential at the PN junction, which is sufficient to break open the, which is sufficient to come over the binding energy because the binding energy of the exciton is very low in the inorganic case. In the case of organic, the binding energy is high. Now, mm -hmm. what exactly is happening at the interface from intuitive point of view, which is uh, allowing it to come over that particular binding energy mm -hmm. and uh, eventually leading to the exciton dissociation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, I, maybe I'll just take take a, take one of your uh, the an early one of your comments first. So, in the case of the inorganic, um, you mentioned the built-in potential, but actually, I, I would argue that if you have a good inorganic solar cell. The built-in potential is not important in separating charges. It's only important in giving a direction. The charges the will separate. Charge. Yeah, and actually, most charge most charge transport in an inorganic solar cell is through diffusion, um, because the junction is super thin compared to the distance over which light is absorbed. And um, so, actually, charges are diffusing. It's like you know they they they're not going in a particular direction, but collectively, <laughs> collectively. They're going to the exit, um, like a crowd, you know. Um, so that that's just so. Actually, the the electric field for the inorganic doesn't matter. It's normally not there. It's normally not not detectable. Um, in the inorganic, the electric field, the or the organic, the electric field probably does matter. Um, but I would say maybe you know there's some evidence that the electric field is helping. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously the electric field will not always be oriented in the right way to vectorially separate charges across the interface. So you're asking what, what overcomes the, the exciton binding energy? And I think, um, so, I mean, what, what happens when you have, I actually have an, another slide that's, I'm going to use, use this one just for the, for the moment, it comes to, to tomorrow, but you have this charge separation event, you've got an exciton and it, and it dissociates. Um, and uh, 
So, I mean, there are different pictures that we use to look at this, and it's very common to look at things in terms of an orbital picture, but it's more correct to look at it in terms of a state picture. <laughs> but I've got some sort of correspondence here between the orbital and, and the state picture. So in terms of the, the orbital picture, we consider, you know, that when the you have an exciton, and it may be bound, so some of the um, some energy may be tied up in the electron and hole attracted to each other. But the when the when the electron transfers um, to another material, it's got the benefit of that energy difference due to the difference in the electron abilities of the two components, and that will help to compensate the binding energy between the electron and hole. So there'd be a stronger binding between the electron and hole here than here. There'll still be some here. However, the electron has given up some energy. Um, and the, I mean, so, so that's kind of, yeah, we can talk about that. It's probably uh, easier, you know, to kind of rationalize it if we think about the energy of, of the state. So we have an excitonic state and then we have a charge transfer state. Um, and um, in the in the sort of free energy of the state that should include um, the binding energy and it should also include any entropic effect due to density of states. Um, so the, 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 Coulomb, the, the energy of the charge transfer state will be influenced um, by these orbitals, by the Coulomb binding energy, and the transfer will occur or can occur if the charge transfer state is lower in energy. Of course, it could occur if it was higher in energy, but it would be less likely to. Um, so, so why does it happen? And I'm going to say, well, it's because there is a, a you know, a contribution from the uh, difference in electron affinity, um, which overcomes uh, part or all of the difference in the Coulombic binding energy. There may also be a contribution from an, an entropic contribution, which comes from the availability of CT states. So if there's, there are many different configurations in which uh, the electron. I mean, I mean, for, for the exciton to CT, probably that's not so important. For CT to CS, it may be important. So um, mainly a difference in electron affinity. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, you mean to say that the difference in electron affinity is what is driving the electron injection from the donor to acceptor? It, that would be the main thing, yes. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ravi Kishore, uh, we'll just take your question quickly and then move to questions from students. Ravi, Ravi Kishore? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Jenny. Uh, so this, uh, uh, just a continuation of uh, the previous question. So this conversion from an uh, excitonic state to a charge transfer state, this conversion, how, how, what is the, exactly the mechanism? Does it that the exciton breaks and reforms or is it just uh, uh, jumping across? I think you're asking me about. <laughs> I, I I think my, my my reaction to that is I I I wish I knew, um. So I mean I think you know we're, we're at time scales and length scales where you know we may have a coherent uh, excitonic process going on, um, okay. And I think you know if I mean certainly so we we certainly uh, have got there are systems nowadays where this excitonic state and the CT state are close enough in energy that they have effectively hybridized. Um, okay. And if you if you look at the structure of those electronic states, you could see something which is not quite an exciton, not quite a charge transfer state. And I think okay. that for those systems, it is very likely that you have some uh, state which is, you know, as you say, jumping, you know, backwards and forwards between the yeah. two um, or yeah. some, you know, some hybrid state which evolves evolves over time to be mainly charge separated from having been mainly excitonic. Um, I mean, it's it's not, I mean, there, there will be, you know, nowadays there will be spectroscopic tools that, that might help to be able to explore these processes, but they're still really rather fast compared to to what we can look at. Um, but but I but I but I do I do think that that I mean so I think that as as the as the CT and exciton become more resonant, I think it's okay. the, this picture of having a, a you know a kind of a, 
not so well defined state that some that some sum of the two, which is evolving in time, is probably is is probably relevant. So can you think of some sort of a superposition? Yes, I think you can think of a superposition. Yes, absolutely. And, so then, and then, I mean, what, what you see, what you see, for example, um, as the states become more, as these states become closer in energy and they hybridize, you see the CT state beginning to look like an exciton. I mean, so if you look at its emission with electroluminescence, it gets brighter. Um, and a CT state shouldn't be bright because it shouldn't have a high oscillator strength. But when it mixes with an exciton, it becomes brighter. And you see that, you see that in, in experiments. So I think, I think it's, it's, it's very fair to think about this excited state as being a superposition of the exciton and the CT state. Just one more follow-up question. So what is the effect of this level offsets on the device efficiency? Uh, uh, par pardon me, the, the effect of the level offsets? Yeah, yeah. So between the oh, yeah. and you, you mean you mean how does it affect the how does it affect the solar cell? Yeah. Yeah. So so the main the main effect of the offsets, I guess it's it's sort of illustrated in a cartoonish way down here, will be to affect the size of the um, potential difference that you can generate. Okay. Um. So if we consider the molecular sort of the orbital picture, like over over here. You know yeah. the um, the hole is confined to the donor. The electron is confined to the acceptor, and then the size of Fermi level difference that that pair is able to generate is going to be limited by those mm -hmm. homo and lumo positions. So if you have a larger offset, um, then uh, for the same gaps, they get closer together and the voltage gets less. So the effect of this level offset would be in influencing the open circuit voltage. Um, okay. more than the current. The current current would be dominated rather by the absorption spectra of the two materials. Okay, I think. Okay, Ravi, uh, is that okay? Yeah, thank you, Jay. Yeah, okay. yeah, thank you, Ravi. Um, now, let, let us go to some student questions in the chat, uh, Jenny, that would be a good place to start. Um, sure. Sai, uh, Sai Shushma, uh, she has asked, when the mobility of charge carriers are increased, there are possibilities of formation of traps at the surface of the band. Um, how can the traps be reduced? So, if, if I if let, let me repeat it, and you can t tell me if I got it got it right or not. As when when the mobility of charge carriers is increased, there's a possibility of Trap traps. Of Hmm. At surfaces, okay. trap formation right. at surfaces, or or maybe do you mean that the charge carriers are able to reach? Yeah, traps that's what. So, at so, the surfaces. So surface of the bands, she's actually meaning the electronic structure. So what she's saying is maybe yeah. there are sub there there are trap states which are sub band gap or um, and how do can these traps be reduced um, in a solar so in a device? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that I, I find the easy way to, 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 to answer that because we, 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 we don't use, we, it's, diff, it's quite difficult to use the, the, the band structure um, yes. concept right. for organic semiconductors because we don't normally have periodicity. Right. Um, and I would have said that when you have defects in the band gap that they would affect things when charge mobility, charge carrier density right. and mobility are low um, and, and become less important when the charge carrier density becomes high, uh, simply because you know, you, you're not dependent on getting a charge carrier out of a trap in order to, to make the current flow. Working, yeah. um, so that's not normally, normally with, with the, the common view, there may of course be, be exceptions, but the sort of the more common finding with, with organic semiconductors is that mobility can increase with a charge carrier density. And that has been assigned to the filling of traps. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a concept. Um, in, in a way, um, in solar cells, you're, you're, you, you don't have that much control uh, over the charge carrier density because it's controlled by, by the, the sun. Um, 
so you, you tend to be working at relatively low charge carrier density so uh, and I mean it's a quick question is how, how do you control traps or what are the origins of traps I mean this, yes. this is this is another question I could talk about that I don't know maybe I should or we should go to other questions yeah yeah I think I, I think you more or less addressed it um, I guess her her major point was in correlation to the inorganic part how does uh, the, whether traps do play a critical role in organic sort of sense so so I guess that absolutely yeah. absolutely absolutely so so yeah yes that's right so i mean i, I think I, I mentioned that you tend because there's disorder you tend to have tails of states sure. so sure. states that tend into the band gap sure. and because they're low in energy for whichever charge carrier they tend to be occupied and when they get occupied they have the effect of pulling down the quasi fermi levels for those two charge carrier populations and that will tend to reduce the open circuit voltage so they're, they're definitely bad news Correct. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Sona Das has asked, what is the typical exciton binding energy in organic semiconductors? Well, um, there is evidence. <laughs> that, 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 that's, it's, quite, it's quite a hard question to answer. Yes, of course. I'm, not, I'm not sure that it's really yeah. known. Hard but question. the typical typical value, I mean, I might, I might hand over to Satish to answer this. <laughs> Um, the the typ typical typical value that we think about would be um, sort of some tenths of electron volts, so maybe two, three hundred yeah, electron yeah, volts. Yeah, hundred to three hundred milli electron. Exactly, hundred to three hundred milli electron volts, and yeah. and and that's what we. I'd say we almost know that in, empirically rather than by any direct measurement. Yeah. I mean, for example, okay. we know that that is an offset in electron affinities, which is big enough to to separate charges. So. That, that type of thing. So yep. the easy answer is 0.1 to 0.3 EV. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Suraj Yadav says, what factor determines the exit on lifetime? Why charge separation, why charge separate state is above the charge transfer state in energy level picture? I think you can uh, talk about the second one first uh, because what factors determine the exit on lifetime is already... <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it, I think there's it's a question. There are multiple questions in that question. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. the second question is why is charge separated state above the charge transfer state in the energy level picture? Well, no, no. I mean, it, it, it's sorry. There, there was. I did have a picture where it, where I mean, it can be. It, it can be it's so so okay that's um it, it should for it to happen it should be below and in the picture we're looking at now it is uh slightly below it can also be above so long as it's not more than kt it can still happen um so where who, you know so so, so so i could maybe take take a, the, the, the question of what, what is controlling the energy of the charge set why is i mean you could ask the question which is uh why is it below <laughs> Which yeah. might be more. Um, yeah. Well, they take the question: what, what controls it? So, um, uh, the charge separated state. So, so typically, I would say, um, when you go from charge transfer to charge separation, if you don't have any difference in microstructure of a material, I mean, there's other things that might that might influence. There might be some local gradient in in energy levels that would actually stabilize charges when they separate if you don't have that then one of the important things will be the density of state so when you have an electron and holes tied together at an interface they are there in one configuration but there are many ways in which they could separate um, and the fact that there are many ways in which they can separate is tending to push down the free energy of the charge separated state and that's one thing that would assist but on the other hand, what opposes the separation is the fact that the electron and hole in the CT state have got some Coulomb binding energy that they must overcome. And so there's a competition between the Coulomb binding that wants to keep them together and a sort of free energy or entropic effect that wants to uh, separate them. And um, uh, they, 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 I mean, th there will be some and configurations in which CT states can can yeah. dissociate. Otherwise, we wouldn't get correct. Right. Yeah. 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 So JD, probably the I think this Abhishek Mahapatra's question. I think it's 
she's coming anyway for tomorrow non fuller in solar cells yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so i i just want to take one or two questions from youtube because otherwise these guys will feel left out so this uh, i'll just i'll just take uh, so jay there are a couple of very uh, what would i say uh, a little bit uh, questions which may be a little bit far away from the stock but they're kind of interesting to ask uh, some students are asking this <laughs> will it be possible to take energy from solar neutrinos instead of photons in the near future i think in the near future probably not <laughs> <laughs> okay okay um and then um the other kind of questions that uh, people have asked there is um uh, can you like what if a pn junction solar cell is emerged into a caged potential and i have no idea what that means i'm not sure that that i understand it is it is you understand the question no i think i no i think what is the case potential no i was just trying to... i have no idea about that uh, but i'll just uh, take one more question uh, yeah. because we we are trying so um uh, there is another question which says how to inflate squeeze electron in a solar cell such that we get the desired amount of voltage and current this is another uh question which just popped up in youtube so i'm sorry if sorry, sorry sorry it, sorry would you mind re repeating that cuz i didn't yeah, actually yeah. Ca catch everything that's yeah. yeah so how to inflate or squeeze electron in a solar cell such that we get the desired amount of voltage and current this is so, kind of i think this is a little bit i i just don't um, uh, understand what does it mean inflate Yes, I have no idea what that. Yeah, is. yeah, that's okay. I think exactly. some of this, some of this question. I think Jenny is very tired now. Yes, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay, but I, but I. <laughs> no, so, so Jenny, that. Jenny, yeah. just wanted to tell you that there are a bunch of questions in YouTube. Yeah. You yeah. Want to we can, we can, we can figure out later. We can revisit yeah. some tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think, I mean, it could, it could mean so the inflating and squeezing electrons. I mean, it could simply be. I mean, to get a desired amount of potential, you need to have a certain. I mean, I think it kind of makes sense. You want to get more yeah. charge density in, and I suppose the simple way to do that is to increase the light intensity. Yeah. Um, and the other way to do it is to try is to, if you can, uh, switch off or slow down the recombination pathways. So, so if you want to, you know, in, inflate or ex you know uh, enhance the density of charges inside, that will give you a higher potential. and the way to do that is either to provide more light or to slow down recombination and either way you increase the the ratio of generation to recombination and that ratio determines your your voltage okay um so you basically need to make your solar cell better okay <laughs> okay okay um and um uh, i'll just like to uh, just take two questions ashwarya's question and lubhanshi's question first lubhanshi uh, build the device structure uh that you make that in increases the charge collection also lead to more recombination sometimes um and how do you avoid that well i mean that 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 you know that that's a very that's a very important thing so the things that the things that you yeah so for example um if you wanted to increase collection of light you might make the device thicker Right. and if you make the device too thick um right. then charge carriers are needing to travel too far they have more chances of recombination so there will be some optimum mm -hmm. and you know how do you uh, avoid penalizing the device you would just have to you know either do a lot of measurements by trial and error or better um you would measure the um recombination dynamics and the charge carrier um mobilities in the material and then work it out um with the with the device physics what what would be the optimum and of course if we could improve the um, mobilities um that would avoid this this problem because eventually you would get to the point where there's no need to um make the device any thicker you're already harvesting basically all the light and the mobilities are good enough and and then you worry about other things like contact Okay okay thank you and um, Ashwarya Abhishek uh, has asked a question 
if it is the difference in the lumo or the homo energies which drives the separation of excitons how do you explain the high external quantum efficiency as well as the high voc in recent non fullerene acceptor based systems can you give well, me yeah 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 <laughs> yes. so he's in the field he is in the community and you will ask the question yeah 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 sure 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 i mean uh of course, there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of debate about this, and um, you know, I mean, I mean, one one thing is 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 definitely the, the case is that the non-fullerene acceptors are better. Um, so uh, if you explain high, high VOC, you know, VOCs are getting higher, but they're not yet at the level of gallium arsenide or you know, best perovskite devices or something. So they're getting better. Recombination losses are getting less. Um, and that's something which is very interesting. Um, so um, the the I mean, in the end, I'm saying so when I tried to answer the question earlier, I was using this this diagram that's on the screen at the moment in order to try to indicate in the end, it's going to be the energies of the states um, that matter. Um, when the energies of the states get very close, then we probably should start looking at the temperature dependence. Um, to try to figure out um, what what gaps are, are really involved, um, and and there, it's actually quite difficult to work out the energies of the state. So a lot of people, like including my group, we we like to try to estimate the energy of the charge transfer state using luminescence, but that might not be a very good guide to the energy of the um, of the of the interfacial state. Um, it might not be a good guide to the energy of the charge separated state. So, so I mean, I think there's a lot of ideas around. I, I try maybe to come back to them tomorrow rather than uh, squeezing it uh, into the answer here. And of course, I'm, I'm also more, more than happy to hear um, the questioner's idea about uh, what's going on. That, that's interesting too. We, we don't really know yet. I mean, yeah. the, people have different ideas, but there are some very strongly held views. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. That's good. Okay. <laughs> about what's going on, but I mean, my honest answer to this is it's very interesting, but I don't think we really know. Right, right. No, no issues. No issues, Jenny. I think this was wonderful, and and thank you for doing this almost two hour session now with us. I know, as Satish is mentioning, you are tired after all that stuff, but um, we will return back tomorrow, and I I think we will start from the third part of your today's talk yeah. And, yeah. and then go on to the next and we'll yeah. go on to the next part yes sure okay uh, great thank you um, thank and you. i would like to mention uh, on behalf of satish and uh, myself that we are really really happy that acs the american chemical society is supporting this uh, session uh, they have provided these uh, you know the zoom licenses for this and and uh, they have actually also advertised it in their uh, website. So thank you, ACS. Thank you, Deeksha. Thank you, Ajay, for making this happen. So just wanted to say that. And uh, Satish, you have any uh, final No, no, comments? I think that's it. So I think the, you said already. So uh, once again, just thank you very much. It was very, very, you know, informative. And we, I think student community certainly certainly benefited me all of us have benefited but i think this was very very uh, thank you very much for doing this one jenny that's what i was yeah so we'll see you tomorrow yeah thank you jenny bye bye then bye 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 bye, -bye. thank you everyone